Yes. I'm recording it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for coming, everybody. This presentation is about the history of Black debate. Um, I am overwhelmed with the responsibility to present this history. It is not. It is not what I would call an exhaustive study, because there is several moments in Black debate, particularly the last ooh, 30 years or so that I've left out. The reason being is that I feel like we have uh, very little context as to how the modern debate experience with Black people has started. I think particularly as it relates to the post-internet generation, so the people after the year 2000, I think a lot of those people are, are extremely famous and rightfully so, but they're just a large segment of people who really do not understand how these things come in, came into being. I also think the lack of contextual information about what, it about what it has meant to be Black in debate has forced us, or maybe uh, even I would use the word coerced us into romanticizing the common era, the modern era, and to believe that this is the most radical time that we've ever seen in terms of Black people in debate. I think that what I want to accomplish with this particular presentation is to really start to answer the question, who are Black people in debate and why have they emerged in the way that they have? So, uh, I wanted to, to share this slide. This man is Reverend Dr. Thomas Freeman. He, we recently had the privilege of honoring him at the 2019 NSDA Nationals. He was 100 years old uh, and on the cusp of winning another his HBCU National Championship. He coached debate for more than 70 years, uh, almost, and was not only one of the pioneers of the activity who was seen and, and thought about in so many, and well respected in so many aspects, but I think the fact that very few people know who this person is, I think points to some of the problems that we have in the activity as it is. I think that my generation is probably the most guilty in that we have done a great job of propping up ourselves, but have really not really acknowledged our ancestors. So if y'all could do me a favor, um, if just for a second, I don't really know where you are, but if you would join me in a moment of silence for Dr. Freeman who passed this year, and then I'll continue. Thank you. Uh, I uh, will move. So this is the image of what you think Black debate looks at, looks at now. The person, Dr. Freeman, um, is the older gentleman, obviously, in the front. He's in the front of this. Uh, can everybody see this picture? Elijah, can you see this picture well, or can I enlarge it a little bit? It's great. OK. We sorry, Elijah. I heard. I, I hear you. Uh, this was the 2019 celebration of Dr. Freeman. These were, uh, I, I won't use the word all, but the vast majority of the African-American participants who were present in Dallas for this event. Uh, we, uh, Dr. Freeman was given the Lifetime Achievement Award by the National Speech and Debate Association. And then we had a private luncheon where just the African-American participants slash black participants were given uh, an opportunity to have lunch uh, with Dr. Freeman talk to him, he shared lots of his experiences, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, this is just the image of what it is. I think um, for almost all of the students who are present, this is what black debate looks like for you. There are many different people who think many different things from many different areas, et cetera. And this is sort of the image that you have. But this is the culmination in our, in our political moment. This is the culmination of a lifetime of history, of a lifetime of people working very diligently to be uh, a part of the conversation. So uh, Dr. Freeman for me is while an individual, also a metaphor of the way in which ancestors really did a lot of things to put us in the position that we are. So I wanna start with what black debate means but the way that I think is probably most appropriate is to engage in a conversation of what um, academic pursuit has, what academic pursuit uh, 
how they are connected to a history of the United States and neglect. So in this particular slide, uh, and I'll make these things available so that you, want, you can read it at your own leisure, essentially what is being argued here in, by Gary uh, Stephen Wilder, who wrote the acclaimed book, Ebony Ivy, Race, Slavery, and the Trump History of America University, is that the modern academic structure was created and founded on anti-Black racism. The vast majority of what we now think of as the Ivy League and the colonial uh, academic bastions of intellect were founded not only by slave holders and then their, their children were subsequently educated there, but literally were built by enslaved Africans. And so you start thinking of places like Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, also Rutgers University, where I attended and so did Mr. Smith. I think there is a, uh, an inextricable link between anti-Black oppression and the way we think of modern academia. So next, I think we need to understand the conceptions around Black intellect. I think that I cannot explain to you what the meaning of Black debate really is until you understand how whiteness slash white supremacy thought about Black people. Okay? Cotton Mather, who uh, was arguably in his time, in the era, in the, 16, the 1600s to the mid 1700s, was considered the greatest theologian in the Western world, arguably. Uh, he actually is so important that Ibram Kendi, in his book, Stamped from the Beginning, Beginning, has an entire chapter named after Cotton Mather. And essentially, what Cotton Mather argued in a, in a profound piece of literature that is, is difficult to read if you read it with 21st century eyes, but he argued in, in his article, The Negro Christianized, essentially the importance of white paternalistic care of the black, of black folks because A, we were lesser beings than white people and without uh, their parental supervision, we would never be able to evolve into truly human. And also to take the cake that God, the providential divine had endow black, white people with the responsibility of black folks. So I think you all need to really, really genuinely think about that when you think about what that means, that now you're at the Global Debate Symposium and there's Edward, Ed Williams and Elijah Smith and Aaron Timmons and Demarcus Powell and Mr. Alston, right? Um, and all these other people who are black who are responsible for your education. You imagine that this would have been counterintuitive for people like Cotton Mather. Also, you got to remember that enslavement was not something that people were ashamed of. Uh, there's a John C. Calhoun quote that's at the bottom of here that kind of talks about this, the role of uh, slaveholding as a noble reality given to people by God. Now, I'm going to spend a bit of time here because this is a disturbing piece of science, and I use the term loosely here. But I need you to think about this, that this was not published in some rinky big newspaper. This was not published in some, uh, I guess, the modern day TikTok, whatever, right? This is published in the American Journal of Medicine. And essentially, the argument here speaks to things like body type, like uh, the way black people have evolved, is that quite literally, we are incapable of rationality and only hypersexual, irrational, pathological behavior. And it is just a scientific fact if you study black people. Now, the interesting part is that William Howard, the doctor uh, who published this article called The Negro as a Distinct Ethnic Factor in Civilization, is publishing this at the same time that W.E.B. Du Bois is publishing The Souls of Black Folk and becoming probably the most important intellectual of the 20th century. So you just got to remember, that these counterintuitive anti-Black ideas are running right next to Black intellect. Um, I would like to show you this video so that you can understand what our ancestors, who become the bedrock of the bedrock of the beginning of Black debate, are up against.
Og vi kan godt se. Så vil det på. You're still sharing the PowerPoint now. Okay, What did you say, Elijah? I'm sorry. You're sharing the PowerPoint, not the video. Okay. Um, should I be hitting a different button? So you just go to share screen and then share the different tab. Um. Share the different tab. Yeah, so to, to start sharing the PowerPoint, you went to share screen and select the PowerPoint. Now you just go back to share screen and pick the new tab in your browser that you would like to share. Could you just hit the YouTube thing and it would automatically take us to it or no? Okay, I think, I think we get, hold on. I think I got something. Hold on. I got something. No. What are y'all looking at now? Still the PowerPoint. Oh, now it's the video. Did it. Or a video. Great. Not a problem. We almost there. One sec. You all see that now? Yeah. Okay, great. of the 20th century, the motor age was dawning all across the United States. African Americans embraced the automobile as the prophets of the open road. Chris, uh, some people are saying that the video is uh, giving them some issues and they wanted to know if you could send the video to them in the chat and they can watch the section you want them to watch on their own.
So you want everyone to watch the first 10 minutes right now? Sure.
Okay, everybody come back in three minutes. All right, uh, everybody should be in back in now. Okay, allowed you there. Uh, Mr. Austin, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, because it was saying my speaker. I can hear you, but you're a little blurry, but I can hear you. Okay, because it was saying my, my speaker. Well, now you muted yourself, Chris. Okay, we good? Yeah. Okay, so I think that based on the video, I think you all should, can now have a political context to understand the origins of black debate. Dr. Freeman in 2019 told us a story about how he had to feed the Wiley, I mean, the Texas Southern debate program that he ran. So essentially, early on in his debate career, he started coaching debate during the height of segregation. So depending on where they were going to debate, he would go, he'd get the yellow pages, and he'd look for a preacher's name. And then he would call that preacher. And then, uh, typically, it would be a black minister in the community, wherever he was going, and that's where they would stay. And so, all of the everything that we miss about the global debate symposium being in person and uh, our ability to relate to one another, imagine a time when that was illegal. So, you have to go uh, eat at segregated places, be at certain places at a different at a certain time, don't be on the road at a different time, all of that. So. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to we're just going to kind of send up some of this and help you understand. So let's talk about Melvin B. Tolson. Melvin B. Tolson is one of the legendary figures of the Harlem Renaissance. But for the purpose of this thing, we're going to talk more about his relationship to Wiley College and the Wiley College of 18. He was its director 
at, at its height from 1929 to the middle of the 1940s. The Wiley College Bay team was undefeated for a 10 year period. So between the years of 1929 and 1939, they were completely undefeated. They also were a part of the first interracial debate. So when I say interracial, I know I've learned from other presentations. When I say interracial, I mean black folk being in academic debate competition against non-black people. In this context, white people. Yes, somebody say something? Okay. That being said, the first time that an interracial debate took place was in 1930. And Wiley College was a part of both of the those debates. One, um, one with having uh, one against the University of Michigan Law School, the other one was against Oklahoma City University. Okay, so uh, based on what we what I told you in the previous slide, understand that the pressure of being a debater in the early 20th century meant you were keenly aware of the level of anti-black racism that you were dealing with. Lynchings were happening daily. They were being talked about. You lived in communities that dealt with it. You were aware of just the fear and death and the possibility of fear and death every single day. So the, the thought that you would even you would even have the emotional or psychological fortitude to engage in debate was an incredible thing. And so I think that with the first point that I want to make is we need to change what we think of, how we ch change how we think about the concept of radicality. When people say that something is radical, what we often do is we look at spectacular displays of that. But if you are existing in early 20th century America as a black person, you can be lynched you can be killed for looking at a white person, for walking on the same sidewalk as a white person, or if a black male got within a certain amount of feet of a white, of a white woman, he could be lynched. If a black person laughs at a white person, they could be lynched. So I need you to just kind of understand the political context that these people are engaging. This is a picture of the 1935 Wiley College debate team. In the middle, is a man named hey chris y yes your powerpoint isn't shared right now we're still on the youtube video so you gotta switch back to the powerpoint okay. how about that what do you see now rodrigo you'll see the youtube video so in the zoom you gotta hit the share screen again and then hit powerpoint there it is now you're at the powerpoint again okay that's melvin tolson this is the 1935 debate program, okay? So the middle is uh, Henry uh, is Henry Height. To the left of him is Hobart Jarrett. Now, a lot of what we think about now in terms of black debate, one of the things that has been a major question is the question of the role of black women in the activity and black women's role in the activity and how uh, black women should be thought about in the context of the activity. But black women's participation literally goes all the way back to the 1930s. The conception of what we mean when we say uh, the role of women in conversations, I think the reason why we can have certain conversations in such a misandric way is because we are ignorant of the history of things. Uh, Henrietta Bell Wells was not only was actually the first black woman recorded to have participated in an academic debate in America. She was also the first uh, black woman on the Wiley College's debate team, but she was also uh, a high ranking member of the debating society and had lots of ability to control the team and the direction of the team, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, racial ideas. So black people, back to this question of radicality, black people understood that they were not speaking for themselves. They were speaking as representatives of a oppressed community. Um, much to uh, my dismay, a lot of what we think about as quote unquote black debate today is rhetorically, uh, it's a rhetorical performance of white supremacy. And what I mean by that is what we've said is that uh, it's about me, it's about myself, it's about 
my particular gender, or my particular sexual orientation, my particular class status, etc. But the earliest debaters had a much clearer perspective of what their rhetoric meant uh, to, the, to the betterment of the whole of Black America. If you read this particular slide, Hope by Jerry, who I showed you in the earlier slide, that was this young man to the far left. Uh, his face didn't look petty. Uh, but if you look at him, he's a young man in the far left. And what he essentially argued in W.E.B. Du Bois' Crisis Magazine is that white people always associate their superior, superiority with intellect. And he said that based on the way that the Wiley College debate team and other black debate teams across the country were able to destroy these young white people in debate with judges who, who were mostly white, proved to him, proved to them that they were not as intellectually superior as they were. And in fact, in many instances, based on the resource disparity, based on their ability to feel comfortable in their own skin and live very comfortable lives, the fact that they were losing to, to these black folks proved that they were not intellectually superior at all. So they saw the rhetoric of academic debate as revolutionary action. And understand that the penalty for such action and the audacity to be intelligent in the face of white people was death. Now, Melvin Tolson, who was the director of this program, that, as I said, that was undefeated for 10 years, had a very particular teaching method. Uh, I'll put in the work side of things at, uh, at the end, I'll give you where this came from. But essentially, what Melvin hey, Tolson was. Yeah. Sorry, you're a little bit like, there's a little bit sort of a buzzing sound. And so it's a little bit difficult to understand you. I don't know if turning off the video would help or if it even has anything to do with that. But I just want to let you know because I just want to be able to check. Is that, can you still hear it? Yeah. No, so, go ahead. Go ahead. Is there a buzzing sound? A l slightly. Um, go, on, go again. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you okay there. Okay. I kind of think that what's happening, Chris, is that as your vo like as your volume rises, the mic kind of starts to freak out. When you're just talking at a conversational tone, just like kind of quieter, there's no feedback. But I don't like because you're not talking that much louder. So I don't know if that's the issue, but that's kind of what it sounds like. Okay. How about now? Is that better? Yeah, there's no feedback at that volume. Okay. Um, so uh, Melvin Tolson's teaching method was an amalgamation of the academic traditions that produced him. He grew up in the black preaching tradition. And what I mean by that is the African-American faith tradition has a very particular kind of rhetorical performance. Um, one of the reasons why I played the particular song that I played before the presentation was to give an homage to that history. Um, African-Americans have had very few spaces where we could call our own, have relationships with one another, have positions of authority, et cetera. And one of the major places of that was the black church. It's one of the few places we felt comfortable displaying intellect because they were homogenous spaces, largely the only place that existed uh, beyond white supervision. So when Tolson was teaching his, his students at Wiley, one of the things that he would do was he would blend African-American rhetoric he would b blend uh, traditional academic sources, and he would also take like black folk language, and then just sheer suppressive shock and awe teaching, and uh, and combined it so that the best of who the students were as people could be combined to deliver impactful speeches. So uh, the the notion of how we judge debates now are very similar in that people, whether they like it or not, bring their emotional selves to the question. And so what Tolson wanted to do was to force black students to be all of who they were in these rhetorical spaces. And it became a pretty radical teaching method. Uh, because of the interest of time, I really wasn't able to highlight everyone who I thought was relevant to this discussion. But based on my research, there were between the, the mid, from the early 1900s after the year 1909, when the first intercollegiate black debate happened between Morehouse University and Talladega University. Uh, from that period until the middle of the 1960s, there were highly functioning uh, black debate leagues 
along with intercollegiate uh, black debate happening on an interracial level. So in the 1930s, there was a Tennessee-based historically black college. I don't have the name of that university because the studies, the two studies that were available about that time period, while there were several other ones, they, I found debate studies about black participation that go all the way back to 1935. But a lot of this was attempting to give almost like newsletter sort of coverage to black participation in debate. So all we know uh, of this particular team that did this amazing thing was that they were from Tennessee. They went on an international debate tour that covered more than five countries, uh, debated teams from different languages, all of that, and the tour was six months long. And essentially, people from all over the world stood in complete awe of these debaters. It was a shock for many people in white parts of Europe to imagine young African Americans, young black folks that had a command of the English language, dressed impeccably, but also had a very different way of speaking and engaging that was different, but not deficient. This was one of the first times that they had seen black people in academic settings. Most of what we know about black travel internationally at this time are people that are entertainers, et cetera. But this particular debate team was invited all over the, all over the world to do this. Uh, there was the Pentagonal Debate League that had several, had several men, members. And then there were Alfred, legendary debate coaches, Alfred Edwards of Southern University and Dr. Nick Ford from Morgan State University who were competitive debate coaches. And I think that these particular programs, given the data, seem to be some of the more competitive programs in terms of winning championships uh, intra-racially and also uh, debating teams who were white. So Howard University was a part of District 7, which uh, myself and Mr. Smith debated at Rutgers. We, when we debated at Rutgers, we debated in this particular district. In 1954, the same year as the Brown versus Board of Education uh, decision, the District 7 national qualifier from that district, which means this was the team that went to represent that district at the national tournament, was from Howard University. They were one of the teams who competed the most nationally in terms of against high-ranking universities. And this team, according to the research and the records of things that I've seen, and one study goes all the way back to 1940, absolutely was one of the more competitive programs in the country and extremely dominant. Uh, the director of the program, sorry for the terrible photo, but because of the era that we're talking about, black people were often not photographed in many different ways, particularly not in academic situations. But what I do know about this photo is the man in the photo, the, this, uh, I'm sorry, go back. The man in this photo is Dr. Osborne T. Smallwood. He was the long-term director at Howard University. And this is one of the black women who were a part of the team and, as the, and there were many. Um, a lot of the records show that black women had a very acute presence on debate teams, particularly historically black college uh, debate teams, and were some of the most prominent members. They held captainships, et cetera, et cetera, and were in charge of the forensic societies writ large. This is a picture of the team from 1954. Uh, it is uh, practicing for the NDT. This is uh, one of the assistant coaches, like a grad assistant here. And here's some of the other members of the team. Uh, one of the other major things that I kind of wanted to get to that I think begins to sorry. One of the major things that I wanted to get to in this conversation, which is most important for me, and I wanted to show it was that, which is why I showed you the video from the Green Book documentary, is that these debaters were literally driving through lynch mobs to get the tournament. Uh, these debaters were faced with all sorts of adversity. These debaters slept in cars. These debaters sometimes went hungry. These debaters did everything they could to be adequate representatives of the race. And I think that they understood themselves in a far greater context, far beyond anything that I can think of now. I went back and forth as to where I would stop the conversation from a presentation perspective, but I think that a large amount of people uh, are so high on ourselves because of the, the era that we debate in, and we think that we are so special and everything we do is so revolutionary, 
but we cannot actually conceptualize the kind of violence that these debaters went through. And I think that we would have a more functional black debate community in terms of the way it relates to itself intramurally. And I think that we would have a more adequate and a, and a far better representation nationally if we could lean on this history for an understanding of the way we should behave. Um, I also think that there is lots to be said, um, and I could, talk, I could talk on and on and on about the ways in which, you know, it shifted the way in America that Black people were known of. Uh, the first interracial debate between Wiley College and Mich University and Michigan Law School in 1930 had an audience of 1,100 people. We couldn't get 1,000 people not in the debate community to watch the debate now if we gave away the tickets. And so it, think, it just tells you about the impact of these sorts of academic competitions had in America. And um, I think that we've been remiss not celebrating people like Thomas Freeman, not celebrating people like Melvin Tolson, ignoring people like Dr. Smallwood and Henrietta Bell Wells, and all these different people who participated in this history. Um, the last thing I'll give you, and then I'll open it up for questions, is it has come to my attention that there were nearly 300 debates per year uh, in, involving historically black colleges from the middle, from the beginning of the early early part of the 20th century to the mid part. I think that there are as adequate evidence to say that they were nationally competitive and well respected, uh, regardless of race and color. And I think that. Um, based on having conversations with Dr. Freeman last year, I think that one of the things that we need to do better is to venerate this history and to archive this history. Um, one of the things that I feel terrible about is the push that now debaters have against being videotaped and all of that, because I wish that there were records and recordings of these people debating. I think that there would be so much we could learn from that. But I think that we just need to be better stewards of our history and to realize that there are very particular there are particularities of black history, but that black people have never been docile to oppression and have always used whatever skills they had to be agents against it. So that's the end of that for me. I am now opening it up for questions. Can everybody hear me? Hello? Yes. Okay. yes. yes. So we can open it up for questions. Uh, Mr. Randall, could you repeat the stuff about like recording you like broke out there for me? No, I just said I think that we should. I'm I'm sad that there are black debaters who don't want to be recorded because I feel like that is a history we'll lose, and I think that that's uh, selfish for generations going forward. Okay. Um, I have a question about um, Mr. Tolson. Mm -hmm. So I watched the movie The Black Debaters. Is that like uh? It's called The Great Debater. Or yeah, The Great Debaters. Is that a representation of him, like an accurate representation? Uh, it is hard to have an accurate representation of a man that spoke four languages, was a published author, an academic, um, and living in the middle of like the Jim Crow era. I think, the, I think based on the research I've done, I think it's an adequate representation, but I think you need to read the things he said in order to understand his perspective. Uh, I actually, that's a great question. I also want to read this. Um, he, in 1944, published uh, a book of poetry called Rendezvous with America. And one of the lines in it that just captured my imagination, it says, uh, I have a rendezvous with America at Plymouth Rock where the Mayflower lies, L-I-E-S, where the Mayflower lies, battered beam on beam by titan-chested waves that heave and shock. Um, in these midnight dawns of the vulture, Philistines of the, of the unquiet seas, and the rattlesnake Attilas of the uptorn seas, in these mid midnight dawns of the Gethsemanes and the Golgothas of people, America stands. And that says to me that he understood very much how violence played in what America meant for itself um, and how that worked as a foundational piece. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does this history change the kinds of arguments you think are important to be heard in the debate space? Sure. I think it changes the way people should think about themselves as radical. Um, 
I've, I've done, I've gone through a lot. I've been discriminated against. I've had racist things said to me. I've had kids not want to debate in front of me because they thought I was incompetent for whatever reason. Uh, I've had, I've had, you know, people do all sorts of things. I've been excluded from a tournament that I thought we, we would qualify for. I've seen, you know, all sorts of things. Um, mediocre white people getting jobs that, that super qualified black people are, should get and all of that. But, and even in the face of that, which I think is horrible and should be resolved in some way, um, I still haven't had to drive through a lynch mob. Like, I still didn't, like, there were people threatening Melvin Tolst. Like, there were incredible things. Um, there's a scene in The Great Debaters where they literally drive through a lynch mob, and the full article by Hobart Jarrett that I referenced uh, in the presentation, the full article, like, talks about them having conversations, like, if you're going to be on this debate, debate team, you got to be about that life. Like, you can't be afraid to die because it comes with what we're attempting to do. So, like, you should just know that going in. Anybody else? So these, just, oh, no, you can go. All right. So these debaters, apart from overcoming these lunch mobs, how were they, over, uh, how were they able to overcome, like, judge bias in the debate space? I, I, don't, I don't What do you mean? Like, the judges, were there, like, judge biases when they were debating? Uh, yes. White people have been racist for a long time. Yes. Okay. They didn't, white people didn't wake up yesterday and get racist. Sorry. I don't know if you know that, but that's, yeah, no, they, they've been racist for a while. What was the name of the um, person who wrote the article that was a part of, like, that three-man debate team that was on the far left of the picture? Hobart Jarrett. Hobart, how you spell it? H-O-B-A-R-T-J-A-R-R-E-T-T. -T. All right, cool. I have that. I have that. I have the article from the the original article from the crisis digitally on my computer. If you're interested, Todd, I'll send it to you. you read it. Yes, that'll be great. Send me an email and remind me. All right. Anybody else? I've got a question for you, Chris. Mm -hmm. uh, and this falls a little outside the scope of what you're talking about. So if you think this is better handled later or elsewhere, obviously feel free to say that. But uh, if kids are interested in kind of picking up at the end point of where you left off, because mm -hmm. obviously there's not time to do like the last 30 years. And I think what you said makes sense about not covering it. But do you have thoughts on like resources that they should seek out where they can do that research for themselves? Oh, for sure. Um, um, one of the things that I'm going to do is that I'm going to attach the work cited page. I, for some reason, I just didn't add it to the presentation, but it has a list of all sorts of uh, articles that have come out in the last 30 years about the last 30 years. Okay. And what I'll do is I'll just put, the, you know, different articles people can read to, to kind of pick up. Uh, one of the reasons why it was interesting to me to do, to teach this history is I think that we have made it seem like Black debate just started in 2000 <laughs> or whatever it is, right? And that is just so far from the truth that it's blasphemy. I have a question. Yeah. Why is it that you think the average student um, who may not be black needs to know this kind of history? What would be the relevance to them, do you think? Well, I think that Number one, I think that if, if you just speak selfishly, I think that having more information leaves you more competitively uh, in a better position to win these debates. I think having an understanding of where these people are coming from and what their history means and all of that, I think just puts you in a more comfortable spot. The next level of the conversation, I think, though, Mr. Timmons, is that when people can situate Blackness in a particular way, and say that the way to be black is this particular way because I say it is, sometimes history, like this kind of history, troubles that, right? I would love to see what Henrietta Bell, if Henrietta Bell Wells were alive today, uh, Ashe, uh, if she was alive today, I would love to see what she would think about some of the rhetoric that black women say about not just black men, but that black women's participation in the debate, right? I would love to, to know 
what Melvin Tolson would say about some of the things that black coaches, you know, do and say and behave how we behave in certain positions. You know, I would love to know what that would be like. I also think that that having that history, I think, allows you to then question the way that some people engage in the activity. Uh, I have a question about like the first part of that answer. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you elaborate? It more like how we apply it to the people like okay. we're debating. Come, come, Ali, can you just do me a favor? Just going forward. Yeah. The rest of camp. Just ask the question you really ask the question you really want to know. It's okay. I won't, I won't get mad. Just ask the question you really want to ask right now. Well, I'm just asking what does it mean? Right, right. But you have a but there's a there's a question underneath that question. What's the question? I don't know what the question underneath this question. What you really want to know is so how do I use this to win a debate? Oh yeah, the part where you said it was like there's a selfish person. Purpose. There you go. Why you just just come in there with it? Just come okay. on with it. Come on no, in the room, Ali. It's good. Just... Huh? What's the selfish purpose then? Well, but I'm glad you asked. Essentially, if somebody says this is what blackness is, and this is how an argument about blackness should go, the history doesn't say that that's necessarily true. One of the quotes from the presentation uh, that I didn't, it was in one of the slides, but I didn't get to, is that. Uh, black debaters actually believed that they were going to be a part of a larger democracy and that there was a, one of the things that I came across again and again in the research, and there was one study from 1940, another study from 1955 that undergirded a lot of what happened in this, in this presentation about black debate. One of the things that came up again and again was how they didn't want to talk about the racial angle because they were going to be a part of a larger democracy. I think that that's a thing. Uh, the problem I have with that is if you just simply start there, then if you look at protest pictures from the civil rights movement, in the middle of the 1960s, there are signs of black people wearing, I am a man. Um, and that man is not, is not a gender. It's like a man, like Sylvia went to me to like human, mm -hmm. I, I'm a human being. And if you're saying in 1963, we're, man, we're wearing signs that say, I'm a man. And in 2020, we're saying black lives matter. I think that that's a place that I think you better be at least be able to get to. So talk about how black debaters kind of had the responsibility to represent blackness as a whole. Do you think that black debaters still have that responsibility? And if so, what is a good representation of like black people within debate? Um, when, while you was asking that question, I just heard Jay-Z in my mind. I'm not black, I'm OJ. Uh, I think that black people certainly, I don't think there's a right way to be black, but I think that there is a unique post-civil rights millennial generation perspective that the way to be black is to do you. Whether or not that has anything to do with how good, like the betterment of the community. So what I'm saying is, Sanaa, I feel like when I teach you, and even when I teach students who don't look like you, I have, a, I have a responsibility to do what I think is most pedagogically responsible in that particular moment, and that, should, that can be modeled going forward. So there's certain things that I might feel at a particular time that I wouldn't actively tell you to do because I understand the implications of that behavior. Mm -hmm. Just because it works for me doesn't mean it's a portable pedagogical model that I feel comfortable with. So if Melvin Tolson hadn't carried himself the way that he carried himself, there would be no Aaron Tim. Right. I watched Dr. Byron Arthur introduce Thomas Friedman um, in a heart wrenching, uh, riveting introduction at last year's NSDA Nationals. Right. And he said, it ain't all about me. Like I'm standing here, but it's not all about me. And if you talk to Aaron Timmons and Tommy Lindsay and all these other people, they'll tell you it ain't just about them either. That makes sense. Right. And yeah. so, so, so now I would say as somebody, um, trying to give you guidance is that you should ask yourself, is the way that I'm about to comport myself, behave, think, write, or research good for generations who come after me? Mm -hmm. Right? So yeah. there were moments, there are gut check moments in every Black person's life where they have to decide, how do I engage this particular question that's in front of me? And, and some people make the selfish choice, right? And that selfish choice is sometimes radical or sometimes conservative. Like Ben Carson makes selfish choices. So does Clarence Thomas. Mm -hmm. Right? But, you know, what if Martin Luther yes. King doesn't go to Memphis, Tennessee to represent 
sanitation workers, where am I? Mm -hmm. Right. So it, it, that's that's what that's the larger larger answer to that. And I think that one of the most disgraceful things is people feel like I'm gonna get mine, you get yours, because if that was the case, we still be on the plantation. People forget Harriet Tubman left the, left safety 19 times so that somebody else could be free. Other people would have would have left and never came back. And in that case, I feel like that is just gross and embarrassing, to be honest. And that's why this history means so much to me and why I'm so passionate about it. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Uh, so you said that we have to change our conception of radicality or like what radicality means. How exactly do we change that conception? What, what, what do you mean? Uh, so you said that we need to change concepts of radicality. So my question is, how do we change those concepts? So, so if, if you think it's radical to play rap music in a debate, I think it has, I think rap music has pedagogical value, don't get me wrong. And I think that if somebody plays a rap song in a debate, you should answer the arguments that the song is making, for sure. Uh, but if your conception of that is like, this is the like, like I can put myself next to Melvin Tolson, who's driving black kids through lynch mobs, or I can be Thomas Freeman, where because he's extremely light-skinned, he goes into segregated restaurants, where there may not be another black restaurant that will serve his students for miles, and he risks his life to literally feed his students. They used to call it Cafe Freeman. He would, because he was light-skinned and he had very, uh, very uh, uh, straight hair, he could, and he had, he had very gentle African features, he could get in, go into restaurants. People would perceive him to be black. By the time they realized he was black, he was usually leaving with the school, right? So just to, like, I take for granted that when I'm with Mr. Timmons and the Green Hill team, I take for granted that we can just, me and Anna and Bennett can just go into a restaurant together, order and come out. I take that for granted. I don't, there's times I don't even think about it. But just that act of feeding students was like a life or death question for Melvin Tolson, for Melvin Tolson and Thomas Freeman and people like that. So I can only imagine what Dr. Osborne Smallwood from Howard University was thinking driving through uh, Texas, Tennessee, Arkansas, you know, at, at the height of that. So we need to be able to think about what those existential risks are and compare that to what other people are doing in debates and question if that's really radical. Does that make sense for now? Uh, yeah. Anybody else? Um, I think this may be a question that just applies to like people who suffer from oppression in general, but how do you, how does one like balance being part of an oppressed community and like having their accomplishments be recognized for that? Like, but also being like their own individual, like you were saying with like those selfish choices. Like, I mean, all these black debaters we were talking about, like how do they like balance like, okay, being celebrated as like a black debater, but also just being celebrated as like a good debater regardless of like their skin tone. And then like, is it even right to separate that? Like if so, like how do you separate that? Well, the boys, the W.E.B. Du Bois in a book called The Soul of Black Folk has this thing called double consciousness. And he's like, to be black is to be, you know, to be an American, a Negro, two warring souls, right? Whose dog and strength alone stops him from being torn asunder. Like, so there's an American and then there's a Negro. And the way I like to teach, when I teach Afro-pessimism, um, I say like, I write the word African and American on the board, and then I put the hyphen, and the hyphen is the middle passage. So whether or not I decide to actively say I'm black or not, which I do, um, people are going to read me that way. The question is, how do I take the privileges of, of academic learning and activity of debate and push the agenda of black people generally forward? Or am I just concerned with getting mine? So there are people who cursed other people out in debates and embarrassed black people and made it think that, and made everybody perceive that to be, to be, to do black debate is to just be uh, problematic and out of control. I don't think that that's good, right? Particularly when, if the history of your people in this activity is some of the most well-learned, well-respected academics on the planet. Like Melvin Tolson was that dude at the time when he was doing it. Speaking four languages, writing three, <laughs> like an actor, 
the Makos, you know, all of that. Man. Dr. Freeman won his last championship last year in 2019 at 100 years old. I'm still preaching at church every Sunday. He got a PhD from the University of Chicago when they literally believed that black people were not smart enough to think. Come on, man. And the way I'm going to represent that is to, is to say I'm ratchet. Nah, not going to be able to do it. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. So sure. basically, when you were speaking with Sana, basically what I took away from that is that even today, like, there's still a code of conduct that we as black debaters must uphold. But even in a progressive society, like, how are we able to discern between, like, something that could possibly be for, like, the greater good, but, like, may be interpreted, like, in a totally different way by, like, the people judging us? So how do we know if we're, you know, doing something that's, you know, I don't know, quote, unquote, breaking down barriers? But I got a real easy way to solve it this way. Imagine if Melvin Tolson or Henrietta Bell Wells or Osborne Smallwood, right, or the, or the Talladega Debate Society, or any of these people were present, and they we turned on a video of your 1AR. Can you, can, could you stand next to it if you had to give an account to them to it? Yeah. Like, it's all good when, when you got, when you're speaking to the choir. But when you're around the council of elders, and you, as the Bible said, you know, there's a cloud of witnesses. Like, what, can you stand, can you put it next to the best of your tradition, your heritage, and your history? I mean, because I feel like sometimes um, within the debate space, Black debaters may feel like they can't be their honest selves and that they have to, like, compromise their personalities a little bit. Mm -hmm. So is that okay? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, I, yeah I give it to you like this. I have... Um, a, a super crazy SAT score. I'm a whatever the whatever the high school equivalent now of 4.0. I go to Harvard University and I attend church every Sunday with my family. So when I come to debate tournaments, I'm ratchet. I talk about having three or four uh, children out of wedlock. Now, if that was my real story, maybe so. But what happens when it's not? What is the pedagogical benefit of, saying, of telling stories about yourself that's not true because people, you realize that white people would appreciate more the pathological stereotype than being comfortable in who you actually are? I actually know gangsters, so now I'm just saying I know actual gangsters. Mm -hmm. And if the people in debate who said they were gangsters actually got around those people, it would not be a good look. That's, there's a fine line between keeping it real and, and being a mental self. And I feel like most people know when they're doing it. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, I need like four or five more questions and then I'll let you all go. It looks like Devin has their hand up. Uh, I didn't see that. Sure, Devin, speak up. Do you have a question? Devin, you, got your, you have a question? Yeah, no, I, I actually did it. I don't know why I raised my hand. That was kind of weird. I'll think about that. Why don't you have a question? A lot of people up here, you this actually affects this is like actually your history. Why don't you have a question? Yeah. Let's assume you don't. Why don't you? I guess you've covered a lot of things. I mean Because last year last year you didn't pay attention either, so I figured I would ask. Wait, excuse me? Last year you were asleep when I was talking about this, so I was just trying to figure out if you had the question this year. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Uh it wasn't funny actually. Oh, no, last year wasn't funny, but uh, just the fact that, you know, that uh, event, I guess, happened and the way it happened, too. Mm -hmm. You have a question? 
Uh, nah, not off the top of my head. Cool. Anybody else? I, I was wondering, uh, because all of these like things, like the Green Book and all of the really like the oppression people have to do to get to certain extracurricular activities like debate, mm -hmm. how does these things? I feel like they still exist, and like. To what extent do they exist? Like, for example, I'm not trying to do this, like, in a different way. I'm not trying to make it, like, trying to get this in the wrong note here. But when I went to UC Berkeley for, like, one debate tournament, I was very, very startled to see the difference between one neighborhood and the other. Like, I'm sure this exists in different types of colleges, but then in, like, one neighborhood, I just saw, like, cops, like, swinging all over, arresting people. And in another neighborhood, it's, like, pristine apartments. And I'm just like, how, why do educational opportunities like these still exist? And why is like this, I feel like there's still segregation in those neighborhoods. And how, given that UC Berkeley is like academic heaven for so many people, um, how, why and how do they still exist in terms of like proximity? Um, Derek Bell has an argument, he has a, a thesis I think everybody should read called uh, The Race uh, the racial realist theory. Racism is permanent. Uh, I think it's called the racism is permanent thesis. Yeah, that's the title of it. The racism is permanent thesis. Where you like racism is permanent. Um, I think the question you're asking is more, why does white supremacy still exist? And I think that has to do with the reality of white supremacy being and anti-black racism being foundational to America. I think that if uh, there's a number, the number one thing that I agree with about Afro, that the Afro pessimists say is that, uh, and it's a line that's pretty famous from the book that Wilson just put out called Afro Pessimism. He's like, tomatoes affect gazpacho. Uh, no tomatoes, no gazpacho. He's like, no anti-blackness, no America. So I think that's the best way I can use it. Yeah, I was just like, more than that, like for something like UC Berkeley, right? This isn't some small town. It's like- Doesn't okay. matter. Yeah, yeah. Afro Pessimists would say the world is plantation. Yeah, there's just like so many opportunities, uh, like right nearby, and it's just very sad to see stuff like that still. It kind of like was a shock to my world. In terms and, of and the fact that it was a shock, I think it's something you should interrogate. Yeah, definitely. Anybody else? Oh, Randall, uh, mm -hmm. I have a question. So the Green Book was really interesting, and I like how it like it uh, chronicles um the life through segregation um i'm curious if there are like uh things examples of like maybe things now like a modern like not not necessarily a version of the green book but things that you think that reflect um the daily lives of people now and that like maybe in the future people will look back and like see how that reflects our lives now and if not if there's anything that like we as debaters should be doing so that we can like chronicle these things into the archive more better well, I mean, the funniest thing is like, this is why it's so funny when people say, uh, oh, I'm, you you white, so you can't read Afro-pessimism. Uh, you, you white, so you can't say this and that, you can't read that. Like, the, to my knowledge, the only book about, I mean, the only book, the only like film about the last 30 years of debate is done by uh, an Asian woman, Mina Lee, in terms of black debate, it's done by that person who was taught by the staff at the GDS, disproportionately, most of that disproportionately black. So the reality is like to answer your question, I think that there are now modern iterations of that. So uh, most of the black people I know are in some sort of private space where they talk to just black people about life. Um, sometimes that's a text group, it can be a Facebook group. Um, we pay lots of close attention to things like Yelp. We know what restaurants not to go in, et cetera. Um, once when Elijah, Mr. Smith and I were at a debate tournament, we get to the tournament, we leave the tournament and we're about to go to this restaurant. Um, it was, I believe, a Chinese restaurant and we are about to enter. I believe this Chinese restaurant is in West Virginia and it's a sit down Chinese restaurant. We go, we get out of the car to go get in the debate team and somebody stops us at the door and says, we can't come in because they're out of vegetables. I can't say that that's Thomas Freeman and Melvin Tolson, Tolson level of racism, but yep. 
it was a it was a vegetarian restaurant called uh, the Vegetable Garden, mm -hmm. and you can see the kitchen from the front door, and there were crates and crates and crates of food that they were currently chopping up and preparing for all of the guests that did not look like us seated inside. <laughs> so, so yes, Joey, that that's a, still a thing, very much so. I think. Yeah, that makes sense. It don't actually make sense, but I get your point. I understand the the, the rhetoric, the Freudian slip there. I got. Two kids with their hands raised now. I don't know if you care who we call on Chris, but Jessica. Yeah, sure, just go for. I just, I can't see, I can't see the. I don't. It's not showing me. It's oh, okay. Uh, Jessica has her hand raised. Go for it. Um, I was just wondering, like, how as a debater or like a citizen in the country, can we best support and like try and foster equality in like society? Like, what can we best do to help people who are oppressed? Um, that's an interesting question. I don't have all the answers. I would say this: the most important thing I think I need you to do um, as a black person is just inter interrogate the people around you, and not like not like from a rhetorical, like, literal interrogation. But when I say interrogate, I mean investigate some of the things that the way people around you make decisions, right? I mean, the quintessential moment for me is, you know, because of how much of my time and my life I've invested to debate, I sit and I, and I think, hmm, my debate partner, one, made history, one, to see the Nationals, and then the NDT, came back, was a top five speaker at the NDT and was one of the top five teams in America. No black people, no black, no team of two black people had ever done that. Has now coached multiple first round NDT teams and has coached an LD TOC champion. That person will be passed over to be hired privately by students for a mediocre white job. And people will pay that mediocre white person thousands of dollars per month to teach in connection to that. And I have not those credentials, but similar credentials, and it would, I would also get passed over. So the most important thing I think anybody can do who is not black is to ask people around them why they, how they make the decisions that they make on their day-to-day -day lives. And then ask yourself, why do you make the decisions you make on your day-to-day? -day? Thank you. You're welcome. Who else? I can't see, so just jump in. Evan has his hand raised now. All right. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of, I guess, uh, I call it an extensive or extended question, but uh, I hope I'll do a good job in explaining it. Anyways, when I had watched uh, a few years back, I uh, watched The Great Debaters, and, you know, we had, like, the Black main characters. They was doing their thing, uh, and they had, like, the, the crowd, the audience. Everybody was watching the debate, and obviously there was no spreading at the time. So it was kind of like uh, the community was involved, and I'm pretty sure once they went home, they were able to spread the art and, like, the, uh, the joy of debate to their family members and whatnot. Anyways, fast forward to that. Uh, the movie Resolve kind of... Um, it kind of explained to me how in certain types of debate, uh, the art of spreading has kind of uh, pushed away parents and like the community members from participating. So my question to you is, uh, why hasn't there been, uh, I guess like a new type or a new form of, de of debate that spawned after, like something that's, you know, uh, I guess something that would incentivize people to come out and participate again, uh, rather than it just being us, uh, just the, uh, the debaters and the coaches at these tournaments. Uh, number one, I think uh, that's a great question. Uh, but I want you to think about this, Devin. Do you know who the main character of Resolve was? Uh, it it kind of it, you, didn't, you didn't. You didn't. Uh, it's a trick question because because he wasn't in the movie. Oh, uh, no. Nah, I just know it, it was the two black boys at first, and then halfway through they switched over. You know, you know who the main character that of that film is? Who was it? Aaron Timmons. Oh, yeah. yeah. Aaron Timmons so is the coach of the Green Hill School, but Aaron Timmons did not make it into the documentary. You know why? Yeah. Because to say that these white students who you are comparing yourself to for whatever reason are doing so good, and these are, this is the height of the, what you should dream to be as a debater, but their coach is black, ruptures the, the narrative of the movie Resolve. 
And typically that's what happens with history is that history actually checks what people actually have to say. So like, for example, the reason why I want to add William to, uh, Mr. Williams, are you here? Does somebody see, is Mr. Williams here? Mr. Williams here? He is. What's your name? Uh, Mr. Yes, good. Uh, Mr. Timmons, could you also turn on your video if you're there? He's not here. He might not be here. Okay. He was here before. Okay. One of the reasons I wanted Mr. Williams here um, was to think about it from the perspective of the reason Aaron Timmons, like his presence in the film doesn't make sense is because you can't tell the white versus black, you know, reality if you really add in the real history of it, right? So the current superintendent of Newark schools went to camp with Ed Williams and they were the only two people of color at the entire camp. So if you think about what, if you think about that there are racism, there's racism, Devin, like in the status quo, can you imagine what it was like going to debate camp? What year was that, Mr. Williams, when you and Roger Leon went to Northwestern? It was uh, 85. Right. So in 1985, and it's just you, Ed Williams, you're from North Carolina, correct, Coach? Yep. From North Carolina and, and Roger Leon from Newark, and y'all the two, only two people at the Institute. True. We were. So if you just imagine what that's like, right? And so when you say, I think that the reality is America has lots of other racial spectacles that they can watch, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, separate from debate. But I think that that's num the number one reason why. And I also think the history just kind of checks that. Go ahead, Mr. Williams. But, but in but in not in the 1980s, like um, Newark, right, was really the only place that was debating on quote unquote the national circuit that had people of color. Right. And that's the thing is that a lot of these debate histories, right, exclude, right, the, um, I mean, Newark in 1980s, uh, they were, no one went to a debate tournament saying, um, thinking that Newark wasn't going to clear, right? I mean, Newark was going to clear, be debating late. Uh, they were considered a top team. Um, my partner and I, we we debated well and and at top tournaments as well but the difference was it was just that you went to those tournaments and you didn't see any other um people of color right i mean the reason why i knew roger leon and terrence and uh all of those people from newark was when we got to a tournament that's all we saw we only saw other people we only saw them right uh and so it was so the, the whole question of being judged by a black person, any of that, right, was not even um, in the cards, right? Because there were not that many black judges, right? So I think that that's one of the things that you have to you have to look at when you question histories, and or just talk about debate in general. Is if someone says that this is when this is the black debate or whatever, right? It's like there was there's always been African-Americans in debate. Uh, and the question is, what happened in that space? What, what changed that space? That, was, it, was the space racist when I was a debater? Absolutely. I mean, I lost a lot of debates because I was Black, right? Um, you know, I mean, I have the famous, the, my most famous um, uh, end of round critique is, you know, the, the the famous uh you are so articulate oh right? you, are, so you articulate. are you are like 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 your 2ar was so good right that you know i i just i like they were so good and but but you know what right i you know like i can't really i can't vote for you right the number of times i got accused for like well that speech man if you had given that speech earlier in the debate or whatever right i did what every other 2ar does right and i would lose uh you would lose those debates and they would tell you that right they tell you that or that or the worst one was you're the best speaker in the round like you were so good you were so good and then you get a four right um and you just have to you know you just accept that right you just and you just keep debating uh, about that and you keep debating keep doing that sort of stuff and like arguments about race have been in debates from the beginning right I mean you know 
I made racism arguments in 1985. People before me made uh, those racism arguments, right? So this is not something that is new, right? So when someone says that, anytime somebody says that they're doing something new, you always have to look at um, that, you know, what are they actually doing? They're not really doing anything. Right? There are very few actual radicals in this, uh, this activity uh, because they, they like, um, right? I mean, if you're radical in debate, then you accept like 90% of the, like 95% of the conventions and then you say, oh, I'm radical, right? If you're really radical in debate, I would start debating when I got to the tournament, right? See, that, that's the thing. Like, none of these radical people want to have debates with people like me, right? Because I would start with them in the parking lot. Hold on, Mr. Williams, we got a question. You have a question, David? What's up? Uh, no, I did have one, but I think uh, Mr. Williams is, in the, is pretty much answering it for me. What's your question, David? Um, I can't, or my circuit isn't very uh, progressive. And right. I was just trying to see on, David, how David, to make some. David, David, now David, yes. David. Now you know I know your family. And yes. the African American vernacular say I know your people. Don't say you're don't say it's not progressive. What you mean what you mean when you what you mean by that? Come on, what I mean is it's more of a, a traditional circuit. What that right. is, Southern Colorado. I, I know, David, I know exactly what you what What's you're the word, David? What's, the word, David? What's the question, uh, David? Ask your question. How can I draw attention to the issues facing black people? Read the argument and make right. them tell you that don't make sense. No, no, David. I think that here's the thing, David. I, I think that what you have to do is uh, point out why the space is the way it is, right? Um, because think about it, uh, all the places out West, right? Post like history, right? The pioneers, right? The people who made it possible for the pioneers to go West were brown people, right? And black people, right? Buffalo soldiers after the Civil War were sent out to protect the forts of the United States right, and um, help pioneers, right? So white people, as they were moving west, were quite literally saved by black, black people. Uh, and, but when you talk about the history of the west, people don't talk about that, right? Uh, and so th that, and then once those black folk went west, right, and it was, and it became, quote, settled, Right, which you know, which means that they just robbed people and killed people, right? Then those black folks were driven out of those spaces, right? Because they were no longer useful, right? Because then now the um, white cavalry, right, came out there, right? Like so, I mean, just remember, like General Custer loses, right? Because he refused to fight with black soldiers, mm. right? I mean, that's, I mean, that. Uh, you know, I don't tell you history that I don't know, right? The reason why General Custer is out West, right, is because General Custer, right, refused, right, to have um, black soldiers under his command, right? And that's, and so when he went to uh, the battle, when he went to his last battle, right, he would, he did not want to take, right, a Buffalo soldier unit with him which is why, right, like, uh, you know, I mean, if you look at the history of the Buffalo Soldiers, the people that were the best at doing their job was the Buffalo Soldiers. Right? Uh, anybody, anybody else have any more questions? So I think that that's what you talk about, David. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any more questions? I can't see Rodrigo, so if you see a hand, I don't really, I don't see him. Uh, Sana has a question, it looks like. Yeah. Go for it, go for it, Sana. Okay, so I'd like to preface this question by saying. You don't have to, just come on with it. Okay, so you know we read, and you know, people on my team were very known for reading like Afro-pessimism and things of that sort, and how like. I know, because I gave it to you, go ahead. <laughs> I know for me, like, 
it's one thing to read it, but to like really understand that literature and come to terms with it, it can be, I don't know if you remember like, you know, those moments that I had at camp last summer, but like really coming to terms with it and how difficult that can be and like that emotional experience and not that, you know, anyone should shy away from debate, but what does like self-care as like a black debater look like when you're reading, you know, uncomfortable topics like this that can hurt you a little bit, like, I got, I got one for you. What? Here, here's, I, I got a, I got a, a, some homework for you. I want you to do. Okay. What you think self care is like? Drive after you get to the pastor's house after you've driven past a lynch mob. What does self care look like in that? Yeah, what, what does that look like? You got a debate in the morning. You debating in front of, you know, fifty people at a university. Mm -hmm. Everybody's coming to see you. They've been advertising it for weeks. The debate is like a high point at the school. Like, because my research says that people, like, it was a well, like, people would invite other universities to come on campus and have a debate, and it would be packed. You know you're dealing with that, but you just drove through a lynch mob last night. What does self-care look like in that context? Honestly, I wouldn't, I couldn't even fathom what I would. Right. What so, that like. so, so if you were sitting there and you was talking to, to Melvin Tolson, if you could use your, your prophetic imagination, your prophetic imagination, and you could look at Melvin Tolson, or you could look at Henrietta Bell Well, right, or you could look at any of those debaters, you could look at Hobart Jarrett, what would they say if you said, you know what? Who this reading is Afro pessimism is just so hard. Oh, what do you think they would say? I mean, my, my intention is not to compare my feelings to anything that they've ever experienced. That's what I'm trying to get, but I'm I'm trying to force you to. I'm trying to force you to, to connect with that. The same way that when you invoke these things, you invoke Afro-pessimism into a white space, that has a thing, that's a thing that happens. I'm trying to force you to connect with that history because I think that will change the way that you understand yourself and the way you understand your pedagogical and intellectual responsibility as a black intellectual doing that. You're not the first person that did that. This is true. So I don't want you to think, it's not that I don't think your mental health or your personal self-care is not important, but I want you to know that you are a part of a, a long lineage, a history, a, a tradition of this kind of speech. Got it. And so I don't want, like, I think that that's a part of, of the generational exceptionalism of the current moment, is that we all think we're special. We're not. It's 24, it's 20. 14, I'm about to be a top five team in the country, and I get to a vegetarian restaurant, and they're telling me that they don't have no vegetables. Come on, man. That's, I mean, I'm like, huh. But I wasn't the first person that that happened to. The reason I showed y'all that Green Book documentary is because this was what it took just to get to the tournament. They haven't read, is this, no arguments have been made. Just, we got to drive, oh, Lord, let's have prayer, because we don't know we're going to make it. We get we, we gotta know exactly where we going. We can't make no wrong turns. Ain't no GPS. We get lost as an L. Like you know, the penalty for being lost is death. Like so, yes or not? I think you have a legitimate question. I just want you to think about it in a historical continuum and don't personalize it so much. Like we may still get stopped by the police, but there's a difference. Or or like me and Mr. Austin. Every time I go on a trip with the Newark debate folk, I get pulled over. I don't care if we're on a bus or what. Getting pulled over. Why? Because we're driving around in Harrison. Anybody else have a question? Yeah, there's two more. Someone messaged me. Uh, Jasmine messaged me that they have a question, and then David has his hand raised again. Yeah. But I think we should maybe call it like five. Yeah. We should. Yeah, I agree. So, Jasmine, you can ask your question. Okay. Um. This question is for both you, Randall, and Mr. Williams. Okay. And it's like, like being black and being a person of color, but I'm like debating in a, especially like going to away tournaments with our team and stuff and having to like face different um, situations with different people, different judges, especially white judges, white, like white uh, opponents. 
how do you like and like facing L's because of like the way you look because of like your blackness how do you like keep up the courage and keep up like the stamina and like mentally to keep debating and not like getting so discouraged by the amount of um of like the amount of pressure that you face within the debate space well i, I guess i, I guess I, i'll go first because I'm, I'm gonna let i'm gonna let the og speak uh last because i know he got something he wants to say well i mean the hard the hardest part jasmine is you know i used to think i was special like james baldwin has this quote you write this down he said i used to think my pain was my own i thought all my pain was my own and then i read so when you meet and i think about some of the things that i went through with elijah and some things i go through coaching and teaching and then i think about thomas freeman is coaching debate in texas in the 1950s what is that like you know, Melvin Tolson is driving kids to lynch mobs. What is happening, right? Like, think about, imagine a Southern University student on the, on the Louisiana circuit in the 1950s, thinking about that there are studies that go about black debate in the 1930s, what that's like, right? And then think of all ideas. So for me, as a person who, not to brag, has given uh, people who are not black more, more L than they got Ws, I mean, the, the easiest part is to connect myself to a tradition and just know that I'm not suffering on my own and that I am a part of a legacy and a tradition and a culture, right? I'm not just in this particular thing on my own, right? I was out of debate by the time I met Mr. Williams, right? I was, I was out of debate by the time I met Byron Austin. But if I had known that um, beyond like the decade before me, that there was a cloud of witnesses, like people who had seen me, when I shook Thomas Freeman's hand, all I wanted to know, I said, sir, well, you know, uh, is there anything I can do for you? And he just whispered in that voice, like, I can't, it's hard to replicate. There's a video of him talking. And just, he said, son, all you can do for me is to be the best that you can be. I just like to hear the good news of us winning today. <laughs> right? Um, and I shook his hand. I have a picture of that moment when he said it to me. And, and for me, you know, that's all it is, is, is connecting myself to a tradition. And to know that even no matter how bad I got it, I don't have it as bad as my ancestors who were enslaved and then that generation right after that. I don't have it like they, they have it. Like it's easy, that's the easier process for me than anything else. Go ahead, Doc. Um, I think it, I think win or lose uh, in debate, I think the greatest thing about debate is figuring out how to win, right? Um, and so do you learn in losses, right? Sometimes more than you ever learn in a win. Uh, and those opportunities, right? You know, I mean, I think that if you quit, the, all those people who want you to quit, they win. Uh, if you continue, right, they see your face again, right? They, they're having to, um, you know, like everybody says, you know, you got to let me in the space. You got to let me in space. You got to do all that sort of stuff, which I, I mean, I think that that's important, but sometimes you just got to walk in and just keep walking. Right. Uh, and so I think that, you know, me personally, I learned a lot from debate. Um, I learned a lot in losses. I learned a lot about how people make decisions. Uh, and that served me well as a debater and a coach. Now, when I was a freshman, was I mad when I, you know, when I thought I won a debate and I lost? Yeah, as I got to my senior year, that, that I, you know, I won a heck of a lot more debates than I lost. Uh, I still, you know, lost a few of those ones where it was unexplainable. But then the questions I asked, right, changed. I was like, so, what could I have done better to have one year to ballot in this debate? And when they really can't explain it, then you understand what their motivation was, right? And, the, and I think the quicker we come to a realization that not everybody has our best interest in mind, the, the quicker as a world we, we, we can start to confront that. So I, you know, so I don't know if that's a, great answer to your question, but I think that's the true answer to your question. No, it is. Thank you. I really appreciate right. both of you. So keep debating. Go to, yeah, keep debating, uh, you know. Okay. <laughs>
All right, we have one last question, and then we, that's it. One last question, Rodrigo, is that it? We have one last question, Rodrigo. Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Uh, it looks like David has his hand raised, but I don't know if it's like from the same question, and you just never there, lowered it, that's another that's question. Fine. Is there anybody other than David? I think David, David doesn't uh, think. So Na has her hand raised, but again, I don't know if it's because right. she didn't lower it or right. if it. We also heard it. from them too. There was 130 participants on this thing. Is there anybody else? That's that's from anyone right, else? But if David has a second question, we're going to answer David's question. What's your question, David? Is David, did you have a question? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, people have been making the Afro pessimism argument for decades. Uh, just through your research, who was the first people who made this argument? A white man named Ben Crawford. He gets thanked in the book. He gets thanked in the Afro pessimism book early in the book. Uh, race based argumentation, though, goes all the way back to the, the Freeman Tolson era. Right. Like, we, like, and then if you think, like, David, if you think about it like this. All of, these, all of the white people they debated start from, the, from 1930 when the first interracial debate happened with Wiley College versus the University of Michigan Law School and Wiley College versus Oklahoma City University from right then till now. If you think of that first debate, these people were aware of the scholarship that said like black people were too stupid to ever have done this. They do not, like I read you the quote, like that's in the Journal of American Medicine. That white, that black people beyond puberty lose their ability to reason. So for a black person to come up and debate civil disobedience or uh, capitalism versus communism or any of that in public is a race-based argumentation. That is a race-based argument because the person I'm standing here watching make this argument, I've, I have, and I mean white people have purposefully dehumanized. Anybody else have a question? And I'm gonna call it a day. Uh, just to check your email after this, I have like a, I have like a question in the email, but it's more specific to like me and personal. Yeah. Got gotcha. it. Anybody else? I guess anybody who wants to hang around after this, they can hang around for a few minutes. You can stop the recording now, Rodrigo. Uh, not me recording, but Lee, if you could, that would be good. Okay, perfect. I appreciate y'all. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Um, for Thank those you who are still for around, the Thank you. Hold on one second. For those who are still around, there's supposed to be a part two of this in week three. So keep your eyes on for that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Randall? Question, yeah. I guess. Uh, what was the reaction?